Book Eleven, Part Two of the Aeneid. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Aeneid by Publius Virgilius Maro, translated by John Dryden. Book Eleven, Debaters and a Warrior Girl, Part Two. These words, so full of malice mixed with art, inflamed with rage the youthful hero's heart. Then, groaning from the bottom of his breast, he heaved to wind, and thus his wrath expressed. You, Drances, never want a stream of words. Then, when the public need requires our swords, first in the council hall to steer the state, and ever foremost in a tongue debate, while our strong walls secure us from the foe, ere yet with blood our ditches overflow. But let the potent orator declaim, and with the brand of coward blot my name. Free leave is given him, when his fatal hand has covered with more corpse the sandron strand, and high as mine his towering trophies stand. If any doubt remains, who dares the most? Let us decide it at the Trojan's cost, and issue both abreast, where honour calls. Foes are not far to seek without the walls, unless his noisy tongue can only fight, and feet were given him but to speed his flight. I beaten from the field, I forced away, who but so known a dastard dares to say? Had he but even beheld the fight, his eyes had witnessed for me what his tongue denies. What heaps of Trojans by this hand were slain, and how the bloody Tiber swelled the main! All saw but he, the Arcadian troops retire in scattered squadrons, and their prince expire. The giant brothers in their camp have found I was not forced with ease to quit my ground. Not such the Trojans tried me, when, enclosed, I singly their united arms opposed. First forced an entrance through their thick array, then, glutted with their slaughter, freed my way. "'Tis a destructive war, so let it be, but to the Phrygian pirate and to thee. Meantime, proceed to fill the people's ears with false reports, their minds with panic fears. Extol the strength of a twice-conquered race, our foes encourage and our friends debase. Believe thy fables, and the Trojan tongue triumphant stands. The Grecians are overthrown. Suppliant at Hector's feet Achilles lies, and Diomede from fierce Aeneas flies. Say, rapid Aufidus with awful dread runs backward from the sea and hides his head when the great Trojan on his bank appears. For that's as true as thy dissembled fears of my revenge. Dismiss that vanity. Thou, Drances, art below a death from me. Let that vile soul in that vile body rest. The lodging is well worthy of the guest. Now, royal father, to the present state of our affairs and of this high debate, if in your arms thus early you defied, and think your fortune is already tried, if one defeat has brought us down so low as never more in fields to meet the foe, then I conclude for peace, tis time to treat, and lie like vessels at the victor's feet. But, oh, if any ancient blood remains, one drop of all our fathers in our veins, that man would I prefer before the rest, who dared his death with an undaunted breast, who comely fell by no dishonest wound, to shun that sight, and, dying, gnawed the ground. But if we still have fresh recruits in store, if our confederates can afford us more, if the contended field we bravely fought, and not a bloodless victory was bought, their losses equaled ours, and for their slain with equal fires they filled the shining plain. Why thus, unforced, should we so tamely yield, and, ere the trumpet sounds, resign the field? Good, unexpected, evils unforeseen, appear by turns, as fortune shifts the scene. Some, raised aloft, come tumbling down amain, then fall so hard, they bound and rise again. If Diomede refuse his aid to lend, the great Messapus yet remains our friend. Tolumnius, who foretells events, is ours. The Italian chiefs and princes join their powers, nor least in number, nor in name the last. Your own brave subjects have your cause embraced. Above the rest, 
the Volscian Amazon contains an army in herself alone, and heads a squadron, terrible to sight, with glittering shields in brazen armour bright. Yet, if the foe a single fight demand, and I alone the public peace withstand, if you consent, he shall not be refused, nor find a hand to victory unused. This new Achilles, let him take the field, with fated armour and Vulcanian shield. For you, my royal father, and my fame, I, Turnus, not the least of all my name, devote my soul. He calls me hand to hand, and I alone will answer his demand. Drances shall rest secure, and neither share the danger, nor divide the prize of war. While they debate, nor these nor those will yield. Aeneas draws his forces to the field, and moves his camp. The scouts with flying speed return, and through the frighted city spread the unpleasing news. The Trojans are descried, in battle marching by the riverside, and bending to the town. They take the alarm, some tremble, some are bold, all in confusion arm. The impetuous youth press forward to the field, they clash the sword and clatter on the shield. The fearful matrons raise a screaming cry, old feeble man with fainter groans reply. A jarring sound results and mingles in the sky, like that of swans, remurmuring to the floods, or birds of differing kinds in hollow woods. Turnus the occasion takes, and cries aloud, Talk on, you quaint haranguers of the crowd, declaim in praise of peace when danger calls, and the fierce foes in arms approach the walls, he said, and turning short with speedy pace, casts back a scornful glance, and quits the place. Thou, Volusus, the Volscian troops command to mount, and lead thyself our Ardian band. Messapus and Catillus post your force along the fields to charge the Trojan horse. Some guard the passes, others man the wall. Drawn up in arms, the rest attend my call. They swarm from every quarter of the town, and with disordered haste the rampires crown. Good old Latinus, when he saw too late the gathering storm just breaking on the state, dismissed the council till a fitter time, and owned his easy temper as his crime, who, forced against his reason, had complied to break the treaty for the promised bride. Some helped to sink new trenches, others aid to ram the stones or raise the palisade. Hoarse trumpets sound the alarm, around the walls runs a distracted crew, whom their last labour calls. A sad procession in the streets is seen, of matrons that attend the mother queen. High in her chair she sits, and at her side, with downcast eyes, appears the fatal bride. They mount the cliff where Pallas' temple stands, prayers in their mouths and presents in their hands. With censers first they fume the sacred shrine, then in this common supplication join. O patroness of arms, unspotted maid, Propitious here, and lend thy Latin's aid. Break short the pirate's lance, pronounce his fate, and lay the Phrygian low before the gate. Now turn his arms for fight, his back and breast well-tempered steel and scaly brass invest. The quishes which his brawny thighs enfold are mingled metal damaxed o'er with gold. His faithful fortune sits upon his side, nor cask nor crest his manly features hide. But bare to view, amid surrounding friends, with godlike grace he from the tower descends. Exulting in his strength, he seems to dare his absent rival and to promise war. Freed from his keepers, thus with broken reins, the wanton courser prances o'er the plains, or in the pride of youth o'erleaps the mounds and snuffs the females in forbidden grounds, or seeks his watering in the well-known flood to quench his thirst and cool his fiery blood. He swims luxuriant in the liquid plain, and over his shoulder flows his waving mane. He neighs, he snorts, he bears his head on high. Before his ample chest the frothy waters fly. Soon as the prince appears without the gate, the Volscians, with their virgin leader, wait his last commands. Then, with a graceful mien, lights from her lofty steed the warrior queen. Her squadron imitates, and each descends whose common suit Camilla thus commands. If sense of honour, if a soul secure of inborn worth, that can all tests endure, can promise aught, or on itself rely, 
greatly to dare, to conquer or to die, then I alone, sustained by these, will meet the Therene troops and promise their defeat. Ours be the danger, ours the sole renown. You, general, stay behind and guard the town. Turnus a while stood mute with glad surprise, and on the fierce Virago fixed his eyes. Then thus returned, O grace of Italy, with what becoming thanks can I reply? Not only words lie labouring in my breast, but thought itself is by thy praise oppressed. Yet rob me not of all, but let me join my toils, my hazard, and my fame with thine. The Trojan, not in stratagem unskilled, sends his light horse before to scour the field. Himself, through steep ascents and thorny breaks, a larger compass to the city takes. This news my scouts confirm, and I prepare to foil his cunning and his force to dare, with chosen foot his passage to forlay, and place an ambush in the widening way. Thou with thy Volscians face the Tuscan horse, the brave Messapus shall thy troops enforce with those of Tiber and the Latian band, subjected all to thy supreme command. This said, he warns Messapus to the war, then every chief exhorts with equal care. All thus encouraged, his own troops he joins, and hastes to prosecute his deep designs. Enclosed with hills, a winding valley lies, by nature formed for fraud and fitted for surprise. A narrow track by human steps untrode leads through perplexing thorns to this obscure abode. High over the vale a steepy mountain stands, whence to the surveying sight the nether ground commands. The top is level, an offensive seat of war, and from the war a safe retreat. For on the right and left is room to press the foes at hand, or from afar distress, to drive them headlong downward, and to pour on their descending backs a stony shower. Thither young Turnus took the well-known way, possessed the pass, and in blind ambush lay. Meantime, Latonian Phoebe, from the skies, beheld the approaching war with hateful eyes, and called the light-foot Opis to her aid, her most beloved and ever trusty maid. Then, with a sigh, began, Camilla goes to meet her death amidst her fatal foes. The nymphs I loved of all my mortal train, invested with Diana's arms in vain. Nor is my kindness for the virgin new, t'was born with her, and with her years it grew. Her father Metabus, when forced away from old Privernum for tyrannic sway, snatched up, and saved from his prevailing foes, this tender babe, companion of his woes. Casmilla was her mother, but he drowned one hissing letter in a softer sound, and called Camilla. Through the woods he flies, wrapped in his robe the royal infant lies, his foes in sight, he mends his weary pace, with shout and clamours they pursue the chase. The banks of Amasene at length he gains. The raging flood his farther flight restrains, raised o'er the borders with unusual rains. Prepared to plunge into the stream, he fears not for himself, but for the charge he bears. Anxious, he stops a while, and thinks in haste. Then, desperate in distress, resolves at last. A knotty lance of well-boiled oak he bore, The middle part with cork he covered o'er. He closed the child within the hollow space, With twigs of bending osier bound the case, Then poised the spear, heavy with human weight, And thus invoked my favour for the freight. Accept, great goddess of the wood, And thus invoked my favour for the freight. Accept, great goddess of the woods, he said, Sent by her sire this dedicated maid. Through air she flies a suppliant to thy shrine, and the first weapons that she knows are thine, he said, and with full force the spear he threw. Above the sounding waves Camilla flew. Then, pressed by foes, he stemmed the stormy tide, and gained, by stress of arms, the farther side. His fastened spear he pulled from out the ground, and, victor of his vows, his infant nymph unbound. Nor, after that, in towns which walls enclose, would trust his hunted life amidst his foes. But rough, in open air he chose to lie. Earth was his couch, his covering was the sky. On hills unshorn, or in a desert den, he shunned the dire society of men. A shepherd's solitary life he led. His daughter with the milk of mares he fed. The ducks of bears and every salvage beast he drew, and through her lips the liquor pressed. 
the little Amazon could scarcely go, he loads her with a quiver and a bow, and, that she might her staggering steps command, he with a slender javelin fills her hand. Her flowing hair no golden fillet bound, nor swept her trailing robe the dusty ground. Instead of these, a tiger's hide overspread her back and shoulders, fastened to her head. The flying dart she first attempts to fling, and round her tender temples tossed the sling. Then, as her strength with years increased, began to pierce aloft in air the soaring swan, and from the clouds to fetch the heron and the crane. The Tuscan matrons with each other vied to bless their rival sons with such a bride. But she disdains their love to share with me the sylvan shades and vowed virginity. And, oh, I wish, contented with my cares of salvage spoils, she had not sought the wars. Then had she been of my celestial train, and shunned the fate that dooms her to be slain. But since, opposing heaven's decree, she goes to find her death among forbidden foes, haste with these arms and take thy steepy flight, where, with the gods averse, the Latins fight. This bow to thee, this quiver I bequeath, this chosen arrow to revenge her death. By whatever hand Camilla shall be slain, or of the Trojan or Italian train, let him not pass unpunished from the plain. Then, in a hollow cloud, myself will aid to bear the breathless body of my maid. Unspoiled shall be her arms, and unprofaned her holy limbs with any human hand, and in a marble tomb laid in her native land. She said. The faithful nymph descends from high with rapid flight, and cuts the sounding sky. Black clouds and stormy winds around her body fly. By this, the Trojan and the Tuscan horse, drawn up in squadrons, with united force, approach the walls. The sprightly coursers bound, press forward on their bits, and shift their ground. Shields, arms, and spears flash horribly from far, and the fields glitter with a waving war. Opposed to these, come on with furious force, Messapus, Chorus, and the Latian horse. These, in the body placed, on either hand, sustained and closed by fair Camilla's band. Advancing in a line, they couch their spears, and less and less the middle space appears. Thick smoke obscures the field, and scarce are seen the neighing coursers and the shouting man. In distance of their darts, they stop their course, then man to man they rush, and horse to horse. The face of heaven their flying javelins hide, and deaths unseen are dealt on either side. Tyrrhenus and Acontius void of fear, by metalled coursers born in full career, meet first opposed, and, with a mighty shock, their horses' heads against each other knock. Far from his steed is fierce Acontius cast, as with an engine's force or lightning's blast. He rolls along in blood and breathes his last. The Latin squadrons take a sudden fright, and sling their shields behind to save their backs in flight. Spurring at speed to their own walls they drew, close in the rear the Tuscan troops pursue, and urge their flight. Asilus leads the chase, till, seized with shame, they wheel about and face, receive their foes, and raise a threatening cry. The Tuscans take their turn to fear and fly. So swelling surges, with a thundering roar, driven on each other's backs, insult the shore, bound o'er the rocks, encroach upon the land, and far upon the beach eject the sand. Then backwards, with a swing, they take their way, repulsed from upper ground, and seek their mother's sea, with equal hurry quit the invaded shore, and swallow back the sand and stones they spoop before. Twice were the Tuscans masters of the field, twice by the Latins in their turn repelled. Ashamed at length, to the third charge they ran, both hosts resolved and mingled man to man. Now dying groans are heard, the fields are strode with falling bodies and are drunk with blood. Arms, horses, men, on heaps together lie, confuse the fight and more confuse the cry. Orsilochus, who durst not press too near strong Remulus, at distance drove his spear and stuck the steel beneath his horse's ear. The fiery steed, impatient of the wound, curvets and springing upwards with a bound, his helpless lord cast backward on the ground. Catillus pierced Iolus first, then drew his reeking lance, and at Herminius threw, 
the mighty champion of the Tuscan crew. His neck and throat unarmed, his head was bare, but shaded with a length of yellow hair. Secure he fought, exposed on every part, a spacious mark for swords and for the flying dart. Across the shoulders came the feathered wound, transfixed he fell, and doubled to the ground. The sands with streaming blood our sanguine died, and death with honour sought on either side. Resistless through the war Camilla rode, in danger unappalled and pleased with blood. One side was bare for her exerted breast, one shoulder with her painted quiver pressed. Now from afar her fatal javelins play, now with her axe's edge she hews her way. Diana's arms upon her shoulders sound, and when too closely pressed she quits the ground, from her bent bow she sends a backward wound. Her maids, in martial pomp on either side, Lorena, Tulla, fierce Tarpeia, ride. Italians all, in peace their queen's delight, in war the bold companions of the fight. So marched the Thracian Amazons of old, when Thermodon with bloody billows rolled. Such troops as these in shining arms were seen, when Theseus met in fight their maiden queen. Such to the field Penthesilea led, from the fierce virgin when the Grecians fled. With such, returned triumphant from the war, her maids with cries attend the lofty car. They clash with manly force their moony shields, with female shouts resound the Phrygian fields. Who foremost and who last, heroic maid, on the cold earth were by thy courage laid? Thy spear of mountain ash, Eumenius first, with fury driven, from side to side transpierced. A purple stream came spouting from the wound, bathed in his blood he lies and bites the ground. Liris and Pegasus at once she slew. The former, as the slackened reins he drew of his faint steed, the latter, as he stretched his arm to prop his friend, the javelin reached. By the same weapon, sent from the same hand, both fall together, and both spurn the sand. A mistress next is added to the slain. The rest in round she follows o'er the plain. Tereus, Harpalycus, Demophon, and Chromis, at full speed her fury shun. Of all her deadly darts, not one she lost. Each was attendant with a Trojan ghost. Young Ornithus bestrode a hunter's steed, swift for the chase, and of Apollyon breed. Him from afar she spied, in arms unknown. Over his broad back an ox's hide was thrown. His helm a wolf, whose gaping jaws were spread a covering for his cheeks, and grinned around his head. He clenched within his hand an iron prong, and towered above the rest, conspicuous in the throng. Him soon she singled from the flying train, and slew with ease then thus insults the slain. Vain hunter, didst thou think, through woods to chase the savage herd, a vile and trembling race? Here seize thy vaunts, and own my victory. A woman warrior was too strong for thee. Yet, if the ghosts demand the conqueror's name, confessing great Camilla, save thy shame. Then Butus and Orsilochus she slew, the bulkiest bodies of the Trojan crew. But Butus breast to breast, the spear descends above the gorget where his helmet ends, and o'er the shield which his left side defends. Orsilochus and she their courses ply, he seems to follow and she seems to fly, but in a narrow ring she makes the race, and then he flies and she pursues the chase. Gathering at length on her deluded foe, she swings her axe and rises to the blow, full on the helm behind, with such a sway the weapon falls, the riven steel gives way. He groans, he roars, he sues in vain for grace. Brains mingled with his blood besmear his face. Astonished honest just arrives by chance to see his fall, nor father dares advance, but fixing on the horrid maid his eye, he stares and shakes and finds it vain to fly. Yet, like a true Ligurian born to cheat, at least while fortune favoured his deceit, cries out aloud, what courage have you shown, who trust your course's strength and not your own? Forgo the vantage of your horse, alight, and then on equal terms begin the fight. It shall be seen, weak woman, what you can, when foot to foot you combat with a man, he said. She glows with anger and disdain, dismounts with speed to dare him on the plain, and leaves her horse at large among her train. 
with her drawn sword, defies him to the field, and, marching, lifts aloft her maiden shield. The youth, who thought his cunning did succeed, reigns round his horse and urges all his speed, adds the remembrance of the spur, and hides the goring rowels in his bleeding sides. "'Vain fool and coward!' cries the lofty maid. "'Caught in the train which thou thyself hast laid. "'On others practice thy Ligurian arts. "'Thin stratagems and tricks of little hearts are lost on me. "'Nor shalt thou safe retire with vaunting lies to thy fallacious sire.' "'At this, so fast her flying feet she sped, "'that soon she strained beyond his horse's head. "'Then, turning short, at once she seized the rein "'and laid the boaster grovelling on the plain.' Not with more ease the falcon from above trusses in middle air the trembling dove, then plumes the prey in her strong pounces bound. The feathers, foul with blood, come tumbling to the ground. Now mighty Jove from his superior height with his broad eye surveys the unequal fight. He fires the breast of Tarkin with disdain and sends him to redeem the abandoned plain. Betwixt the broken ranks the Tuscan rides, and these encourages, and those he chides. Recalls each leader by his name from flight, renews their ardour, and restores the fight. What panic fear has seized your souls? O oh, shame! O oh, brand perpetual of the Etrurian name! Cowards incurable! A woman's hand drives, breaks, and scatters your ignoble band. Now cast away the sword, and quit the shield, what use of weapons which you dare not wield? Not thus you fly your female foes by night, nor shun the feast when the full bowels invite, when to fat offerings the glad augur calls, and the shrill hornpipe sounds to bacchanals. These are your studied cares, your lewd delight, swift to debauch, but slow to manly fight. Thus having said, he spurs amid the foes, not managing the life he meant to lose. The first he found he seized with headlong haste in his strong gripe and clasped around the waist. Twas Venulus, whom from his horse he tore and laid athwart his own in triumph ball. Loud shouts ensue, the Latins turn their eyes and view the unusual sight with vast surprise. The fiery Tarkin, flying over the plains, pressed in his arms the ponderous prey sustains. Then, with his shortened spear, explores around his jointed arms to fix a deadly wound. Nor less the captive struggles for his life. He writhes his body to prolong the strife, and, fencing for his naked throat, exerts his utmost vigour and the point adverts. So stoops the yellow eagle from on high, and bears a speckled serpent through the sky. Fastening his crooked talons on the prey, the prisoner hisses through the liquid way resists the royal hawk, and, though oppressed, she fights in volumes and erects her crest. Turned to her foe, she stiffens every scale, and shoots her forky tongue, and whisks her threatening tail. Against the victor all defence is weak. The imperial bird still plies her with his beak. He tears her bowels, and her breast he gores, then claps his pinions and securely soars. Thus, through the midst of circling enemies, strong Tarkin snatched and bore away his prize. The Tyrene troops, that shrunk before, now press the Latins, and presume the like success. Then Aaron's, doomed to death, his arms essayed, to murder unespied the Volscian maid. This way and that his winding course he bends, and, wheresoever she turns, her steps attends. When she retires victorious from the chase, he wheels about with care and shifts his place. When, rushing on, she seeks her foe's flight, he keeps aloof, but keeps her still in sight. He threats and trembles, trying every way, unseen to kill and safely to betray. Chloreus, the priest of Sibylle, from far, glittering in Phrygian arms amidst the war, was by the virgin viewed. The steed he pressed was proud with trappings, and his brawny chest with scales of gilded brass was covered over. A robe of Tyrian dye the rider wore. With deadly wounds he galled the distant foe. Gnosian his shafts, and Lycian was his bow. A golden helm his front and head surrounds. A gilded quiver from his shoulder sounds. Gold, weaved with linen, on his thighs he wore, with flowers of needlework distinguished o'er. 
with golden buckles bound and gathered up before. Him the fierce maid beheld with ardent eyes, fond and ambitious of so rich a prize, or that the temple might his trophies hold, or else to shine herself in Trojan gold. Blind in her haste, she chases him alone, and seeks his life, regardless of her own. This lucky moment the sly traitor chose, then, starting from his ambush, up he rose, and threw, but first to heaven addressed his vows. O patron of Socrates' high abodes, Phoebus, the ruling power among the gods, whom first we serve, whole woods of unctuous pine are felt for thee, and to thy glory shine. By thee protected with our naked souls, through flames unsinged we march, and tread the kindled coals. Give me propitious power to wash away the stains of this dishonourable day. Nor spoils, nor triumph from the fact I claim, but with my future actions trust my fame. Let me, by stealth, this female plague overcome, and from the field return in glorious home. Apollo heard, and, granting half his prayer, shoveled in winds the rest, and tossed in empty air. He gives the death desired, his safe return, by southern tempests to the seas is borne. Now, when the javelin whizzed along the skies, both armies on Camilla turned their eyes, directed by the sound. Of either host, the unhappy virgin, though concerned the most, was only deaf. So greedy was she bent on golden spoils, and on her prey intent, till in her pap the winged weapon stood, infixed and deeply drunk the purple blood. Her sad attendants hastened to sustain their dying lady, drooping on the plain. Far from their sight the trembling Aaron's flies, with beating heart and fear confused with joys. Nor dares he farther to pursue his blow, or even to bear the sight of his expiring foe. As, when the wolf has torn a bullock's hide at unawares, or ranched a shepherd's side, conscious of his audacious deed, he flies, and claps his quivering tail between his thighs. So, speeding once, the wretch no more attends, but, spurring forward, hurts among his friends. She wrenched the javelin with her dying hands, but wetted within her breast the weapon stands. The wood she draws, the steely point remains. She staggers in her seat with agonizing pains. A gathering mist o'er clouds her cheerful eyes, and from her cheeks the rosy color flies. Then turns to her, whom of her female train she trusted most, and thus she speaks with pain. Akka, tis past, he swims before my sight, inexorable death, and claims his right. Bear my last words to Turnus, fly with speed, and bid him timely to my charge succeed. Repel the Trojans, and the town relieve. Farewell, and in this kiss my parting breath receive. She said, and, sliding, sunk upon the plain. Dying, her opened hand forsakes the rain. Short and more short she pants. By slow degrees, her mind the passage from her body frees. She drops her sword, she knots her plumy crest, her drooping head declining on her breast. In the last sigh, her struggling soul expires, and, murmuring with disdain, to Stygian sounds retires. A shout that struck the golden stars ensued. Despair and rage the languished fight renewed. The Trojan troops and Tuscans in a line advance to charge, the mixed Arcadians join. But Cynthia's maid, high seated from afar, surveys the field and fortune of the war, unmoved a while, till prostrate on the plain, weltering in blood, she sees Camilla slain, and round her corpse of friends and foes a fighting train. Then from the bottom of her breast she drew a mournful sigh, and these sad words in shew. Too dear a fine, ah, much lamented maid, for warring with the Trojans thou hast paid. Nor aught availed in this unhappy strive, Diana's sacred arms, to save thy life. Yet, unrevenged, thy goddess will not leave her votary's death, nor with vain sorrow grieve. Branded the wretch, and be his name abhorred, but after ages shall thy praise record. The inglorious coward soon shall press the plain, 
Thus vows thy queen, and thus the fates ordain. High o'er the field there stood a hilly mound, sacred the place, and spread with oaks around, where, in a marble tomb, their senes lay, a king that once in Latium bore the sway. The beauteous opus thither bent her flight, to mark the traitor errands from the height. Him in refulgent arms she soon espied, swollen with success, and loudly thus she cried, Thy backward steps, vain boaster, are too late. Turn like a man at length, and meet thy fate. Charged with my message to Camilla go, and say I send thee to the shades below, an honour undeserved from Cynthia's bow. She said, and from her quiver chose with speed the winged shaft predestined for the deed. Then to the stubborn yew her strength applied, till the far distant horns approached on either side. The bowstring touched her breast, so strong she drew, whizzing in air the fatal arrow flew. At once the twanging bow and sounding dart the traitor heard and felt the point within his heart. Him, beating with his heels in pangs of death, his flying friends to foreign fields bequeath. The conquering damsel with expanded wings the welcome message to her mistress brings. Their leader lost, the Volscians quit the field, and, unsustained, the chiefs of Turnus yield. The frighted soldiers, when their captains fly, more on their speed than on their strength rely. Confused in flight, they bear each other down, and spur their horses headlong to the town. Driven by their foes, and to their fears resigned, not once they turn, but take their wounds behind. These drop the shield, and those the lance forgo, or on their shoulders bear the slackened bow. The hoofs of horses, with a rattling sound, beat short and thick and shake the rotten ground. Black clouds of dust come rolling in the sky, and o'er the darkened walls and rampires fly. The trembling matrons, from their lofty stands, rend heaven with female shrieks and wring their hands. All pressing on, pursuers and pursued, are crushed in crowds, a mingled multitude. Some happy few escape, the throng too late rush on for entrance, till they choke the gate. Even in sight of home the wretched sire looks on, and sees his helpless son expire. Then, in a fright, the folding gates they close, but leave their friends excluded with their foes. The vanquished cry, the victors loudly shout, "'Tis terror all within, and slaughter all without. Blind in their fear, they bounce against the wall, or, to the moats pursued, precipitate their fall. The Latian virgins, valiant with despair, armed on the towers, the common danger share. So much of zeal their country's cause inspired, so much Camilla's great example fired. Poles, sharpened in the flames, from high they throw, with imitated darts to gold of foe. Their lives for godlike freedom they bequeath, and crowd each other to be first in death. Meantime to Turnus, ambushed in the shade, with heavy tidings came the unhappy maid. The Volscians overthrown, Camilla killed, the foes entirely masters of the field, like a resistless flood come rolling on, the cry goes off the plain and thickens to the town. Inflamed with rage, for so the furies fire the Daunian's breast, and so the fates require, he leaves the hilly pass, the woods in vain possessed, and downward issues on the plain. Scarce was he gone, when to the straits, now freed from secret foes, the Trojan troops succeed. Through the black forest and the ferny brake, unknowingly secure, their way they take. From the rough mountains to the plain descent, and there, in order drawn, their line extend. Both armies now in open fields are seen, nor far the distance of the space between, both to the city bent. Aeneas sees, through smoking fields, his hastening enemies, and Turnus views the Trojans in array and hears the approaching horses proudly neigh. Soon had their hosts in bloody battle joined, but westward to the sea the sun declined. Entrenched before the town both armies lie, while night, with sable wings, involves the sky. End of Book Eleven